Alice McDermott is one of the finest novelists working today. She is the author of novels That Night, At Weddings and Wakes, National Book Award and American Book Award winner Charming Billy, Child of My Heart, After This, and Someone. Her latest novel, The Ninth Hour, is a beautiful interwoven novel of loss and redemption with these flawed, complex characters that will surely rank amongst her most beloved. The, ru the reviews have been rhapsodic, and yes, it's already been optioned for a feature film by Scott Rudin just today. I think my favorite review, though, was one I heard this morning. If you've told me I would love a novel about a bunch of Catholic nuns this much, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> that comes from our head buyer that many of you know, Mark Love from Roz. Cutting straight to the heart of it, as ever. Alice is also a really meaningful contributor to our local literary scene through her time spent teaching creative writing at local universities, including Johns Hopkins, and her consistent support of local authors and bookstores like us. I have to tell you one last Alice story. The other week, there was a misprint in the Washington Post, a book group led by the wonderful Beth Ann Patrick, where Alice's work was going to be discussed, was wrongly listed as an in-conversation with Alice. Her publicist emailed me right away about the mistake, and I sent back this hugely apologetic email. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I don't know how this could have happened. I'll get a correction posted right away. And Lachin wrote back, oh no, Alice isn't upset. She wanted to know if perhaps the group wanted her to stop by and say hi. <laughs> this generosity of spirit is woven through all of her work and all of her characters, and we are so happy to welcome her back here tonight. Please help me welcome Alice McDermott. Thank you so much. Following Patti Smith and Hillary Clinton, <laughs> I think I'm having a nightmare. <laughs> but, and, and Liz, you can go home now. <laughs> uh, thank you all for being here uh, at my favorite bookstore in um, my favorite place. Uh, friends and family and readers and strangers and even non-readers, you're also welcome. Uh, I'm just going to uh, say a few words about this new novel, um, but I know the politics and prose crowd, and I know that um, your questions will be far more interesting than anything I can come up with. So I'd like to save plenty of time um, for you to ask uh, anything you will. Um, I, I'm, I'm, with, uh, I'm with the buyer who feels um, how the hell did I like a novel about nuns? Because for the past year or so, I've been saying, why the hell am I writing a novel about <laughs> nuns? This novel actually didn't begin um, as a, a pr an effort to uh, take back some respect for the, those women of the cloth. Um, it began with a uh, conversation I had some years ago um, at this point, it, it's hard to think about how many years ago, because that would make me realize how long it takes to write a novel. Um, but let's just say uh, a number of years ago, I had a wonderful uh, conversation with a dear, dear friend, a uh, bright and intelligent and always interesting friend, about substitutes in the Civil War. Um, and uh, he had some experience of this in his family, and I knew something about it, probably from high school or college history classes. Um, but I just found myself taken with the notion. Um, I began just sort of reading about how did that work? Um, how, who used substitutes? Um, how long did it last? Um, if I were a historical novelist or historian, I might have shaped a book about that very thing. I found it so fascinating, but I'm a fiction writer. So um, I didn't think about that uh, idea for too long before I started searching for metaphors in it. Um, the idea of one young man or the family of one young man paying another uh, to go off and put himself in harm's way to save the usually the wealthier son or the son with the more promising future. 
Um, a lot of immigrants were sucked up into it. Um, a lot of people down on their luck who needed the money. Some patriots as well, people under age who would volunteer to go. Um, so it, it, you know, looking for this whole idea of what does that mean um, to, to take somebody's place, um, to what does it mean to stay back and to allow someone to take your place? Um, how much do you owe that person you sent into harm's way? Of course, I began thinking about uh, the 21st century and our own military, which is really essentially a military of substitutes. Um, we pay them, and I've heard uh, certain um, of, of my acquaintances um, who say, in some way, we can grieve less when they come into harm because that's their job. We pay them and they go off and do it so that we don't have to. Um, and also that question of um, how long, if you are grateful to the person who's gone off and risked his life or even given his life for you, how long does that gratitude last? Generations? <laughs> Isn't there a time when you have to say, okay, I said thank you. Um, and being um, inevitably, oh my gosh, I can't get away from it, a Catholic novelist, um, <laughs> you can't think about giving your life so that others may live. It's kind of obvious the um, JC is gonna come <laughs> into your thoughts. Um, uh, and so with those ideas, and I started writing about characters, what would be the situation, um, how much do we owe? What is selflessness? Um, do we even know what selflessness is anymore? Um, I've had plenty of young, wonderful, good-spirited students come in and tell me about the selfless thing they were going to do when they graduated from Hopkins or from another university. I'm going to go off and I'm going to work with the poor. And, I'm, and it's always followed by, I think it's going to look really good on my resume. <laughs> um, so what about that uh, sacrifice for another with no reward? Does anybody do that anymore? Um, do we, I mean, do, do, do we care? Do we think people who do that are rather silly? Why not take advantage of your position? Why not put a little in your own pocket while you're serving others? You might direct that to the White House. Why not put a little in your pocket while you're doing a job that's supposed to be for others? Um, so I began to wonder, what would take the shape of someone who sacrifices for another, not only with no reward in mind, but with the idea that that sacrifice would take from that person the thing she most wanted and desired in the world. Um, and then I realized I had to write about nuns because I needed a character who was going to out Jesus Jesus. <laughs> you know, in his last moments, Jesus turned to the good thief and said, within this day you will be with me in heaven. So it's like, just hold your breath, just get through this. I know it hurts now, but boy, it's going to be great. I created a character who gave up that with me in heaven for someone else, um, which I know sounds daunting. <laughs> and given the events um, of uh, our recent history, um, hurricanes and earthquakes and um, Yes, our politics as well as our prose. Um, I, w I was looking through the book today thinking um, there must be something I can read that's, um, that maybe can give us all some heart. Um, so the novel is a basically about a young family at the turn of the century. They're immigrants. Um, the husband, a 32-year-old in the opening chapter, um, performs an act that can be interpreted as both um, completely selfish or completely selfless. 
and that is he takes his own life in order to claim it, in order to say, this is my own life, and no one can tell me what to do. The story then follows uh, his widowed wife, who is pregnant at the time of his death, who's quickly swept up by, and here they come, the nursing nuns who work in uh, and around the streets of Brooklyn in those days. Um, I thought there was just going to be one nun, one nun who comes in and straightens things out. But as soon as you let a nun into your novel, <laughs> here comes everybody. <laughs> Uh, so Annie, the widow, is swept up by the nuns. Um, she, she's needy, of course. She's poor. She's alone. Uh, she's expecting. Uh, the nuns immediately give her a job to work in the laundry um, with the imperious um, laundress, Sister Illuminata. And the nice thing about writing about nuns is they do have great names. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, so in all this bleakness, I understand this is sounding kind of bleak, um, love happens. And I thought that might uh, be something to remind us all of tonight. So I'm just going to read a short section, um, a chapter called Alone, which I know doesn't sound terribly promising, um, but is perhaps the beginning of... Um, for all the selflessness and the sacrifice and the selfishness, um, there's sort of a miraculous coming together that happens in, uh, in the course of human history um, more times than, uh, than the pessimist among us would believe. Alone. Mr. Costello was a quiet, balding man with a ready grin polite and hushed voice when he spoke to the sisters, but loud and full of good humor when he called to people on the street. He was always offering the nuns extra pints of cream or discounts that he seemed to make up on the spot, always admiring the miraculous cleanliness of the empty milk bottles they returned to him. At the invitation of the sisters, he attended Mass in the convent chapel every first Friday, sitting in the last row with his cap in his hands and his head bowed low. When he was 36, Mr. Costello had married a pretty blue-eyed girl. Rheumatic fever as a child had left her with a weak heart. The case of St. Vitus's dance that followed left her isolated and strange. Not a year into their marriage, Mrs. Costello was bitten by a stray dog that was foraging in the tangled backyard of one of the tenements. Infection set in. She lost her leg. There followed a nervous collapse, a touched brain, an invalid's cosseted routine. The sisters called it a sad case. Because they had been so often inside his home, the nuns knew there was no pretense in Mr. Costello. They knew he kept his place in manly order. Few knickknacks, just a pair of Mrs. Costello's porcelain face dials on the dresser in the bedroom, a statue of St. Joseph on the mantel, and that he did as much dusting as a man could be expected to do the top of a bureau, but not the legs, <laughs> the base of a lamp, but not the shade. They knew the apartment's one closet was arranged with military precision and the kitchen cupboards were neatly spare. One bottle of bootlegged whiskey used only for toothaches or colds. The visiting sisters checked it daily. He kept house, all the sisters agreed, like a fastidious bachelor. No hint of anything unseemly to indicate otherwise, or to tell them that he was something less than the good, unfortunate man he appeared to be. The intimacies of bathing and feminine hygiene Mr. Costello left to the nuns. But he cooked his wife a dinner every night, and there was never a dish left in the sink or a crumb left on the tablecloth when the sisters arrived every morning to wake her and give her breakfast. Caring for Mrs. Costello, who was childish, sometimes churlish, 
thin as a rail, light as a feather, was an easy enough bit of duty easily dispensed. Because Mr. Costello was up and gone well before dawn, the sisters could arrive as early as the day required, spend an hour, and then leave the poor woman refreshed and well-fed in her chair by the front window, a small sandwich and a glass of milk and a chamber pot all within easy reach. A sister might stop in again at lunchtime, or if Mr. Costello was going to be delayed, if he had told the nuns that morning, sometimes via only a note left among, among their milk bottles, that he was driving up to the dairy that afternoon or attending a union meeting in the city, they might bring an early dinner as well, and then get her ready for bed knowing that the clean linens and the soothed wife that would greet Mr. Costello at the end of his long working day was the sister's own way of telling him that he had their admiration. Annie first spoke to him in the convent kitchen early on a deeply gray morning with a rain so cold and steady it had kept him behind in his deliveries. He had paused in too many doorways looking for a break in the low clouds. He had lingered in conversation with a complaining old woman he usually hoped to avoid. Against his preferred routine, he had smoked a morning cigarette in his cart, watching the steam rise from the flanks of the patient horse, reluctant to turn up his collar once more, to head out once more with his milk crate into the storm. Annie, for her part, had come to the convent earlier than usual, just as the sisters were going in to morning prayer. The rain had woken her before dawn. No walk with Mrs. Tierney today, and the lack of it made her wonder if she had the wherewithal to get herself out of bed. Sally was three years old, fast asleep beside her. Annie listened to the rain against the windows until the room had gathered enough light to see by, and then she got up carefully. The child was easily woken and made her way into the kitchen. She meant to put the kettle on to warm both herself and the room, but when she pressed her nose to the window to see if there would be any relief in the weather, the old smoky odor of the catastrophe arose again. She smelled it on the wet glass and the damp sill, on the twice repainted kitchen walls, as if the odor of fire and sorrow was contained in the soaked brick of the building itself. She glanced down into the backyard, still too dark to see anything but her own reflection. She imagined opening the window to lean out into the rain, imagined that if she did so, she would feel the sure pressure of her husband Jim's hand on her waist, easing her away, whispering into her ear, ear in that wordless way of ghosts. And what would he say? Would it be an apology, a pledge, a stumbling excuse? or the smiling, wheedling endearments he had spoken to her so often in the past from this kitchen table, from their warm bed. Oh, let me stay where I am a little longer. On the day she buried him, they rode out to the cemetery in Mr. Sheen's hearse. Annie and the undertaker and Sister Saint Savior wrapped in her black cloak. The nun was as monolithic as sunken-eyed as a defeated general. Defeat was all about them as they passed through the dark streets. Early morning it was, rain and snow, Jim, the empty shell of him, riding behind them in the long car. What had God been to her until that bitter morning? Father, guardian, comforter, king, all Annie seemed capable of remembering as they drove was a lifetime of negotiations, of pleas, so many of them until that morning about Jim, that he would smile at her, that he would come to call, please God, that he would cross to New York in safety, 
please God that he would be there to meet her when she followed him, that he would get up out of bed. It seemed the single prayer of her married life that he would get out of bed, go to work, come home, come home with something brighter on his face than that hooded scowl, please God. Please, God, let him put an end to those long breaths through distended nostrils, to the sinking into himself, fists closing for conversations she couldn't hear. Let him recount for her something that had happened throughout his day that was not an insult, an affront. Let him lose his contempt. Let him keep his job. Let him get up out of bed and be on time for a change. That cold morning, the cemetery trees were like black lines etched, etched in window frost, the ground brittle with icy spears of grass. The casket was pulled from the hearse. When a plot was available, they would put him in it. She didn't ask where his body would stay until then. With sister's help, she had money enough only for this. She was going to save the deed to Calvary the Catholic cemetery, for herself alone. She touched the coffin, coated now with the fat drops of melted snow. Sister Saint Savior waved a vial of holy water and said a prayer. The three blessed themselves, Annie and Mr. Sheen and the nun, and then climbed back into the car with their clothes damp. Annie didn't hold it against the church the miserable morning, the cold, unconsecrated ground, the refused funeral mass, not even the money she had lost on the double grave at Calvary. She well understood that there would be no rules at all if there were no punishment for the failure to follow them. Like any good mother, the church had to cuff its children when they misbehaved, make the punishment fit the crime. Jim had murdered himself and murdered something in her as well. Who could argue for leniency? Who could expect absolution? Sister Saint Savior did, of course, but the woman, childless, stubborn, coming to the close of her own life, had a mad heart. Mad for mercy, perhaps, mad for her own authority in all things, a trait Annie had come to love and admire, but mad nonetheless. Riding home from the cemetery, Sister Saint Savior had said, it would be a different church if I were running it. <laughs> and so lifted the burden of that terrible morning with some laughter. But Annie never blamed the church. It was instead the recollection of her own unanswered prayers, simple as they had been, that made her grow cautious in her faith wary of her own belief. Let him get up, she had prayed, how often, boiling an egg and making his tea and hurrying back into the silent bedroom to call him again, hating her own desperation, her own helplessness, hating the way his gray moods and scarlet furies put himself between her and the simple happiness life was offering, a kind of paradise after the poor lives they had left behind, this busy city, his good job, this tidy place of their own, a child coming in summer. Let him get up and get going, she had prayed, avoiding his hand as he reached out from other the blankets he'd pulled over his head, or sometimes giving in. She had done this too, giving in to the luxury of what he wanted to believe, that their time belonged to themselves alone, that they could do as they pleased with it. Now, at the kitchen window, looking into the black yard, tangled and wet, the tangle seeming to writhe in the sheen of falling rain, she stamped her foot and felt the old impatience that was, as well, her most vivid memory of her married life. Jimmy, get up. Only her own pale face looked back at her in the gray glass. Even his ghost was impossible to stir. It was a cold hope 
at best to imagine otherwise, the cold hope never let the less that kept her in this apartment where he had died, where he had lived, when a smaller, cheaper place would do. She woke Sally and they both dressed and pulled on their rain boots. Annie carried the girl the five blocks to the convent, the big umbrella doing little good in the blowing rain and arrived breathless and laughing just as the nuns, their plain faces made plainer still by the lingering traces of sleep, filed silently into the chapel. In the bright convent kitchen, she shook the rain from her hair. Mrs. Odette, the cook, had yet to arrive. Annie was rubbing a tea towel over Sally's wet head, the two of them singing softly together, it's raining, it's pouring, while the sound of the morning psalm floated from the chapel. She saw a black and bent figure through the glass of the back door, heard the rattle of the milk bottles. Impulsively, she pulled open the door, Mr. Costello looked up, startled. Rain dripped from the peak of his glistening cap and from his nose. Poor man, she said, why don't you come in? He stepped inside with no other thought than that he wanted to. He stood, the two fresh bottles of milk in his hands, the two gleaming empties under his arm, his coat dripping on the mat at the threshold. The kitchen itself was not unfamiliar to him, but never before had he seen it like this, so well ordered and warmly lit, with a pretty child seated on the high step stool the nuns kept at the counter, a child big-eyed and curious, and the woman who helped out in the laundry, a tea towel in her hand, smiling to welcome him. No beauty, perhaps, but with lovely dark hair that was wet and plastered in black ribbons here and there on her pale forehead and white throat. Despite the noise of the rain outside, he could hear the sweet voices of the nuns in the chapel. They were singing O Solitaris Hostia, a hymn he had known since his boyhood. Annie stepped forward to take the two bottles of milk from his hands. He saw that one strand of hair ran in a jagged line across her flushed cheek, nearly reaching her mouth, which was crooked and prettily bowed. It was only the long habit of caring for a sick wife that made him, still dripping, reach out to brush the wet strand away. He heard the closing notes of the hymn remembered the Latin from school, the words that touched his exile's heart. Oh, grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee. He was inspired to ask her, where are you from? So for those of you who don't remember your Latin, um, it's, um, these are the things that I just, it just occurred to me reading this, that, um, you know, there are things that you, you kind of, um, you put on the surface of a story, <laughs> there are things that you put just beneath the surface of the story, and then there are things that you sort of layer deeper and deeper, um, and sometimes you just think, oh, probably nobody will get it, but what the hell? <laughs> um, and of course, Osala Taurus Hostia is... Um, o oh, saving victim, or also O oh, saving sacrifice. Um, so that long explanation that I gave you at the beginning, it does reverberate in those words, <laughs> if you're trying to figure out how those two things related. Um, I am happy. Please come to the microphone. Uh, again, if you have um, questions or um, comments or want to correct my terrible Latin pronunciation, I welcome it. <laughs> Yes, please come up. Right there. There you go. Mike, you got it. <laughs> it's right behind you. Right behind no, you. I, I see. There you go. <laughs> um, it, 
in, you know, as a struggling writer myself, and having been an English teacher for 40 years, I, uh, what I admire so much is the layering that you do. <laughs> but starting with the descriptions of color, texture, atmosphere, coupling that with the motion. When you write these descriptions, do you picture in your head what the image is? And then you find yourself describing it in writing? Um, yes, thank you. You all heard that. Um, I think it happens simultaneously. Yes, you, you know, you picture in your in your head just as you hope that the reader will. Um, I think um, Conrad's uh, injunction that the only obligation of the writer to the reader is to make you see yes. is the best piece of writing advice um, anyone can give to any struggling fiction writer, um, to make you see. So in the effort to do that, uh, that means the writer, who is also the first reader, um, needs to uh, commit to seeing. Um, but what fiction does um, is not simply make us see. Um, fiction also, uh, I have to quote Wallace Stevens here because he puts it so nicely in Postcard from the Volcano. Um, With our bones, we left much more. We left what we felt at what we saw. So the fiction writer is always l trying to make you see, but, but at the same time trying to convey what we, us humans, alive in any place or time, felt at what we saw. Um, so, so it's looking for those uh, descriptive elements, those details of place and weather and the five senses, hearing and smelling, um, that are not only there in the story for their own sake, but in some way also convey an emotion, the, um, the emotional state. And I think that's what fiction yes. does that history and nonfiction is not as, as much obliged to do. Um, Thank you. I would say that a writer as gifted as you and other ones I admire have that kind of integrity that the verbs you choose, for example, have the tone and even in a different context, meaning of the emotions that are going on. That's what we're aiming for, right? I mean, that's, yes. um, you know, we can look at photographs if we just want to see, <laughs> you right. know? Thank you. Or we can just look at each other if we just want to see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much Hi for there. this reading. Hi. Um, when you talk about a character, especially a character of faith, a Catholic character, um, who damns himself or herself in order to save others. I immediately think of Graham Greene, The Heart of the Matter, <laughs> or Silence by Shusaku Endo. And so I'm just um, curious if any of those writers, Catholic or otherwise, are sort of humming in the background consciously or, or subconsciously as you're exploring um, this theme. I, I think there's that theme um, uh, goes through Doubt by John Patrick Shanley. I mm -hmm. think there's a line in there about that as well. So I, was, I wonder if you, if you could talk more about that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, probably more unconsciously than consciously. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you do find yourself sort of swept into the corner with all the Catholic writers, you know. Um, or if not, then you're swept into another corner with all the Irish writers, um, you know. Um, and I do find myself, when I'm swept into those corners, kind of looking around and saying, I have nothing in common with these guys, <laughs> you know, or with the Irish. I think, you know, I really wanted to be a Russian writer. I didn't want to be an Irish writer. Um, so yeah, it's there. We're all writing out of a tradition. But, but, um, but you know, the source material is, is in the New Testament. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think it's dealing with that um, and, um, and, and, and that's not my dealing with it. It's understanding characters who were dealing with it. Um, I think that's, that's why I'm interested in characters um, 
who have faith. I just find them more interesting, even if they're wrong and even if terrible things happen because of their faith or even if they're losing their faith. Um, I'm interested in characters who either believe or want to believe or think about belief um, because it just seems to me they're after the same things that I'm after by writing fiction. Um, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, looking at models of Catholic writers um, is inevitable when, when you've um, been raised as a Christian with these stories um, part of your DNA. Thank you. Thank you. Although I have to say, I, you know, often when, when I'm with other books, when I've been called a Catholic writer, it's like I have characters who are Catholic, okay? But, you know, they could be anything. It's not. Um, and just before uh, I finished uh, the ninth hour, I ran into um, the wonderful Jesuit James Martin, Jesuit priest, who has written about me and called me a Catholic writer in nice ways. That's okay. Um, <laughs> And I saw him at a, at a cocktail party, and he said, oh, there's a new book coming out. And I said, yeah. I said, what's it about? And I said, you wanted a Catholic novel? I gave you an effing Catholic novel. <laughs> I haven't heard from him. But <laughs> Hi there. Hello. <clears throat> there's such tenderness in, in so much of your work. And, and uh, I've been struggling to articulate the question, but tenderness is the best word that I can come up with. It's a nice this, word. It's a nice a, word. Thank there, you. <laughs> it's a, and yeah, and, but there's this power with which you, you dive into these characters that have such everyday lives, and, and there's just this palpable tenderness that you bring through. And I was wondering if we could speak about that, the process as you engage with the characters, how you draw it out in words. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope so. I guess it's, um, uh, in some ways, I want to forgive every character in the, in, you know, in the hope that I'll be forgiven, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that um, every character that, that comes on the scene, and sometimes they're, you know, they're characters that sort of have, you've been thinking about and studying, and sometimes they're characters who just appear in the writing as almost as an enigma, and you have to figure them out, um, not only who they are, but, but who they are within the larger story and um, in all the things you're trying to get at in a particular story. Um, and, and I think it's helpful, and, and sometimes I, I, I put this challenge to, to my writing students. Um, what if somebody said that about you, <laughs> you know? Wouldn't you say, you know, okay, yeah, you didn't visit your mother enough when she was in the nursing home. But do you want that to be the only thing anybody ever says about you, you know? Or, yeah, you were really rude in the grocery store the other day. Um, is that the only thing you want? So that asking over and over again, but what else? What else? Um, what else is about this character? What am I missing? Um, don't take a character on face value. Uh, what else can I figure out about this character? It doesn't mean, I mean, the risk you run is you don't want to uh, get sentimental about every character. You don't want every character b to be wonderful. Um, but I think it's that sense of trying to understand every character in his or her full humanity within the confines of they're also a piece of the larger puzzle. Um, so I, I, it, it's often that um, Ident becoming them. I think Eudora Welty says that. She's, she's every one of her characters. Um, you become every single character um, so that you can both look at them from the outside but also look out through their eyes um, and, and beg for mercy. You know, <laughs> like don't judge me just by that. I know I look like this. I know I did, but don't judge me just by that. Um, I, I think early in my career, I was always putting characters in bed late at night, having them stare at the ceiling <laughs> and, and just see what they were thinking, <laughs> you know? Um, get them vulnerable and, and see, not, doesn't necessarily mean it has to end up in the novel, but just see um, you know, what's their dark night of the soul look like. Thank you. Hi there. Oh, hello. Hi, How Alice. Um, thanks for your comments about um, you know Irish Catholic writers. Um, <laughs> as an American writer who happens to be of Korean descent, I feel I'm often shoehorned into the Asian American ethnic writer 
kind of category, so it's refreshing to hear we have, I guess, similar frustrations. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the role of research as a novelist. Um, with this novel in particular, you're talking about suicide, and I'm wondering how you kind of occupy the psychology of that um, with with the survivors. Um, you know, do you interview those who, who are struggling with survivor guilt, or do you just tap into the kind of fiction writer's imagination um, to, to guide you and to inform you? Yeah, thank you, Patty. That's Thanks. a great, great question. A uh, wonderful writer. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've talked about this, this hyphenated American nonsense. <laughs> um, um, in particular, um, writing the, the, the suicide that opens the novel, it was simply the character's suicide. Um, this didn't have to be a suicide like anyone others, as far as I was concerned. Um, uh, this is um, this is a stubborn, <laughs> particular guy, and I just had to um, see him clearly, uh, see his world, uh, listen to his voice, listen to the rhythm of the prose that was bringing me his voice, um, and see what he thought. Um, uh, th that section um, was published as a short story in the New Yorker. And I remember having a conversation um, with the editor there saying, she said, I don't know, do, is he depressed enough? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, this is 1910, there's no right. Zoloff, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's, it, there's also, and I think this sort of addresses the other question too, what you have to give to each character in fiction is, this is a guy unlike anybody else. You want it to be authentic, you want it to be realistic, you want it to be believable, but you also want to insist with every character, no, each and every one of us is totally unique and cannot be defined uh, by a diagnosis, by circumstance, by a hyphenated label. Um, so for that scene, I, 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 the last thing I thought of was to do research. Of course, then writing about the whole era and once those nuns came barging in the door, um, I knew I had some research to do and that, that was great fun. Um, that my research is really sloppy. Um, I, I never really know quite what I'm looking for. I just sort of read toward it. Um, I read, uh, I had great fun reading a lot of um, contemporary newspapers uh, from that time, you know, um, uh, mostly the Brooklyn Eagle because it gave me the, all the, the sense of Brooklyn itself. But the nice thing about that was you also got a sense um, of language. Um, newspaper reporters wrote differently in 1910. Um, uh, there was a kind of delicacy and not. <laughs> um, uh, so that was, that was really helpful in, in sort of phrases that I could then just call on as the world was sort of spinning um, and, and becoming itself. Um, researching nuns, um, wow, this is when I started to feel, now I know why they took me by the back of the neck and said, you're writing a book about nuns whether you like <laughs> it or not. Um, Boy, here's a group of women who have been written out of history. Um, it's incredible when, and I was able to, to, I hope seamlessly, call some attention to that in, in the book. Wasn't the purpose of the book, so, um, and last thing I wanna do is um, write um, a political <laughs> treatise. Um, but uh, their role in education, their role in healthcare, um, the hospitals they built, the schools that they opened, um, the way they serve the poor, the way they serve minorities. I don't know how many of you know this. The Mayo Clinic was started by Franciscan nuns. Amazing. The nuns built St. Mary's Hospital, the first hospital part of the Mayo Clinic, and asked the Mayo brothers. The dad was 70 at the time. The two sons were 24 and 26. So. Think about who was behind the scenes getting things actually done. Um, they asked the Mayo brothers to be the attending physicians at their hospital. The Mayo brothers told them, you're nuts, when they said what, there had been a, a tremendous tornado that ripped through Rochester, Minnesota. Um, people who were hurt were being carried into barns and homes. There was no place to take them. And the nuns who were, I love this, a teaching order, 
they weren't even nurses, said, we need a hospital. And the Mayo brothers said, you're nuts. And they said, if we build it, will you come? <laughs> yeah, see, they also coined that phrase. See, they don't get any <laughs> No credit. Um, um, and, and, and the other thing that I love as, as a um, mostly annoyed Catholic, the Mayo brothers are considered saints in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. In the Catholic Church, we don't even know the names of those nuns. And, and the, the hospital, um, this is not in the book, it's just stuff that you find out, um, that you have to resist putting in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the hospital, St. Mary's Hospital, had such a phenomenally low mortality rate so quickly that this is why people from all over the United States started going to St. Mary's Hospital, which became the Mayo Clinic, because these nuns, teachers, not nursing sisters, knew how to run things, um, and they got things done, and they've been erased from history. Or they have been caricatured, and we all know that. Um, you know, one way to denigrate women's work is to make a joke out of it, or to turn us into witches, um, to pretend to hit golf balls into our back and watch us fall, all ways to um, take away our accomplishments. So that research, um, sort of made me uh, reconciled to this book about nuns that I didn't really want to write. <laughs> Thank you. My, my, <clears throat> my question is about suicide, and I don't know whether you have the answer to this, but I know when I read A Death in the Family mm -hmm. and A Death of a Salesman, um, and just the passage that I heard tonight, you're raising very similar questions. When did the church change its position mm -hmm on how to handle a suicide. Yes, uh, fairly recently, I believe. Mm. Um, yeah, um, uh, for those of you that it's referred to in the reading that, um, that I just did, and it's um, made perhaps clearer in the first chapter, because Jim commits suicide, uh, the church will not allow him to be uh, buried in consecrated ground. Um, Sister St. Savior tries to lie about it um, because she knows that's wrong. Um, and she, you know, she's been working for the church for most of her life. Uh, she figures, um, I can do this, you know, um, when, when, you know, compassion takes, uh, takes second place um, to rules, um, often the nuns step up. Um, I think it was in the 70s um, that was finally uh, began to break down. Certainly it was well after Vatican II. Um, you know, which in some ways is so frustrating, but in other ways um, you think maybe there's some hope. Maybe these guys will realize they can be wrong about a lot of things, <laughs> you know, and that if they maybe let go of, of some of these old, unchangeable, no, absolutely must do silly rules that are not coming from Christ's mouth and not in right. the New Testament, then we can all go forward with the church. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was a fairly recent um, change in a in, in a two thousand year old church. And I know in the ending of Death of a Salesman, it's the insurance companies that will take the hit because they will claim that they will not pay for Willie's death because they do consider it a one passenger car suicide. Right. Um, and so they were as unenlightened as the church, and that was 1949. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, but, and again, it comes down to, to, to this, um, and uh, th I think the novel deals with it somewhat from the sort of contemporary voice uh, of the novel that um, uh, the 21st century, us 21st century creatures, we do want to define everything neatly um, in our own way, mm -hmm. just as the uh, institutions like the church did in, in the last centuries. So we want to say, um, you know, oh, the depression caused it. He was very depressed, and you've right. proven that. And so, right. um, but I think fiction always stands against anything that glib. Um, mm -hmm. No right. one thing defines any of us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. No, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm wondering, as a uh, 
teacher of creative writing, how your teaching of students has shaped your own you know, literary vision and, and the act of writing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've been teaching a long time. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the thing that, that, um, that heartens me the most about uh, teaching young writers um, is that you are perpetually a young writer. Um, that every new story and every new novel, um, you are a novice. Um, it doesn't matter what you did before. Um, credentials don't count when your sentences are not coming together. Um, what you've done before um, is no guarantee that you will figure out how to tell this new story in a new way. Um, and so when I'm with even undergrads who are writing um, their first short stories and, and I see that struggle, um, I know I'm going to go home tomorrow, I'm going to sit at my desk, and I'm going to be going through the same thing. I'm going to be asking the same questions. I'm going to have all the same uncertainties. Um, uh, so there's that sort of, it's, it's, it's a kind of Shangri-La. You never grow <laughs> old, you know. I, yeah, I'm with you. Um, other than that, I think um, uh, there's also the, the, that aspect of, um, you know, do, do as I say, not as I do. Um, and sometimes I hear myself giving advice to young writers, and then I think, yeah, sure, try it. <laughs> yeah, no. Easy for you to say. Like, you know, really throw out these 40 pages because 41 is really where you want to start your story. Yeah, that's easy, right? <laughs> you know. Um, so whenever I give an exercise to my students, I always try to try my own hand at it. Um, and um, I don't always show them the results. I don't ever show them the results, actually. Um, but it's that, that sense of um, uh, you can be a coach, as John Barth calls us, um, those of us who teach writing. He calls us not teachers, but coaches. Um, but it helps to remember th you know, that it hurts when you get hit. <laughs> you know? It hurts when you go down. Um, it's a long way from one goalpost to the other. And um, you're going to get breathless doing it. Um, so it's, it's good to remember that uh, to come down from the coach's perch and go back to uh, messing it up in the mud. And I am just absolutely finished with that metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Like I ever played football. <laughs> Anyone else? We have time for one more question. <laughs> oh my goodness, a surprise guest. <laughs> this is my editor, editor Jonathan Galassi. I just want, Alice, I want you to talk a bit about something that's you do, you've been doing it more recently in your books that I think is very uh, profound and it hasn't really been touched on tonight, which is the layering, the t temporal layering that goes on in the book. You start the book as if it's in the present in 1910, but as we go on, we see that it takes us all the way to 2010. And there's a lot that happens. Ha tell us how that, how that works for you and how um, it, it deepens our, it makes us question so many things when we, we realize the reverberations of these actions in the f into the future, really. Yes, thank you. Wow, what a good editor I have. <laughs> First, I have to say, Jonathan has been my editor since I had 100 pages, not page 101, <laughs> of my very first novel. But I didn't make you throw them out, did I? <laughs> <laughs> and when I sent him this one, this is how lucky I am, um, he had not read anything, I think, except the New Yorker excerpt. And I was at the point where I had no idea I had no idea, and this is again related to teaching. I understand how my students feel. I didn't know what I had. Nobody had read it. I had been uh, on sabbatical and deeply in it for many months, and I sent it off to Jonathan. Um, and 
with the idea that if he called me and said, oh God, Alice, a book about nuns, I would say, no, no, you're right, it's no good. I have another one I think you're gonna like better. <laughs> um, he really had to convince me. Um, and only because I, I trust his brilliance and his good words um, that this book is here um, for many reasons. So yeah, the layering. Um, uh, in, s in some ways, uh, I, I wanted this novel to, and I, should, I shouldn't say this with such confidence, because I didn't know I wanted the novel to do this. I discovered, as I was telling the story, that I wanted the novel in some way to parallel the vividness of belief. Um, so the story is told, um, some people have referred to it as sort of a Greek chorus, um, but it's a collective voice from 2010, uh, looking back through time, um, using stories that are told by the people who were there, stories that were told uh, about people who weren't there, um, conjecture of some sort, um, but I wanted, or I discovered that what I wanted was not the present uh, part of the story, where the voice resides, to be the most vivid thing. I wanted that voice to evoke the past more vividly than the present. Um, and it, I began to feel that that was a parallel to people of faith, um, to believe so fully um, in something that is long past and to see it so vividly and to make it the most important thing in your life and to, and to let it guide your present, it seems to me involves a tremendous act of imagination. Um, so in some ways, this uh, chorus, if you will, this collective voice that's um, every once in a while evoking personal experience um, and putting things together, um, I just wanted to balance it so that it was not a flashback. You know, we've all seen those novels and some of them are wonderful. I'm not saying anything against anybody's choices when they write books. God bless you for writing books. But you know those novels where, you know, the old person sits at the window and it's raining um, and then choo 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 and then we're in 1910, you know. Um, I didn't want that, but I wanted that sense of um, belief that is looking at the past. Um, that, you know, if, if you believe that your great grandparents had a certain kind of life or did certain things or there was an event in their life that changed everything, like a suicide, you weren't there, you never saw it. Um, what kind of faith is that? A, a faith you've only been told, you might be wrong. Um, so I just saw that, that way of telling a story as some subtle, perhaps, maybe not so subtle, some way of um, paralleling this tale um, with the nature of, of belief, um, a kind of vividness, a kind of intuition, um, there, there is, and again, I think I was probably hedging my bets, there, the, one of the nuns um, who's kind of a pistol, uh, Sister Lucy, um, her vocation comes to her because as a child, she's, she's dragged to all the churches. Her father is a tax collector. Her grandmother thinks he's gonna go to hell because he's a tax collector. He tell, she tells little sister Lucy when she's a child that if they pray for him, they can save him. And she, and she drags Lucy to every Catholic church in Chicago, which you can imagine is quite a few. Um, and, and Lucy develops an eye as a child that tells her um, the scenes uh, of, of Christ's passion, of the Annunciation and the Assumption um, of the Stations of the Cross, her eye tells her that is more real than anything that's happening in her life, uh, in this messy, messy, meaningless existence. Um, and because of it, she wants a contemplative life. She wants only to look at that, which is imagination and art. 
um, and nothing that anybody can prove, and yet has a kind of authority that nothing else in her life has. She wants to be a contemplative, but sh she also knows that God wants her to straighten out this mess that he's made, and she's probably the only person can, who can do it. So she becomes a nursing sister. Um, but so, so that, a uh, long way around, Jonathan's like, edit it. <laughs> that would be, he has, Jonathan has this wonderful way of like going, oh, do you really need that? <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, yeah, so, so a different kind of telling, and, and it, uh, I can't say, I don't want to claim that I had this great idea and then, um, and then structured the novel around it. I wrote a lot and wrote a lot of different voices and wrote a tremendous number of scenes that do not appear, um, uh, trying to get that contemporary, trying to find out where that contemporary collective voice resides. Um, and more and more, the more I wrote, the more I realized it, it, it's the background, not the foreground. Now you're all confused. Thank you so Th thank much. Thank you so much, Alice. <laughs>